Hi everyone and welcome to the Inside College Soccer Podcast. My name is Chris Cousins and the founder of SI USA. We have another um, fantastic episode, um, this time slightly slightly different. Um, we've brought on one of our staff members, or a new staff member at least, um, to kind of talk talk to the audience about his experiences. So um, the person in question is Kim Kombutho. He is uh, based in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, our paths first crossed when we were... Um, it was 2015 now, so I was in. I was helping run a PDL side, which is now USL two. Uh, he was playing. This is in Florida. He was playing for us, and and that's when I that's when I first met him. Uh, he's a fantastic guy. Uh, he he's gone on and won an NAIA national championship, uh, various other stuff, and now he's actually back in in Kenya for the last couple of years, uh, helping players uh, with their pathways really. Um, and we've launched. As of today, the SIUSA Africa Division, and Kim is actually in charge of that, uh, is the best person for it. Um, we've been working together on things the last couple of years, and we've helped a number of players move on to the States and, and Spain, actually, as well. Um, so it's uh, it, the, the episode is it, it's long, but it's worth it. it. It tells you about, obviously all it's, it's kind of story but a lot of it is like the the mental challenges that he's had when he moved to the u.s and and there's a lot there's there's a lot more than a typical interview about like tells your life story it's really good for players to listen to and uh yeah it, i'd say um it, it's good for everybody no matter where you are in the world uh, to have a listen to it so um so i'll I'll let him do the talking it, uh, it's a lot better than uh, me trying to explain in, in a short synopsis but uh yeah kim is like i say he's a fantastic guy he's great to listen to i enjoyed speaking to him uh we planned on an hour but it went over just because i wanted i couldn't stop him uh, I, I wanted i wanted to carry on and uh, listen to the full story um and it was really enjoyable so yeah um aside from that um we here at siusa we've just just announced our First ever college preparation camp. Um, this the first one's going to be in Heisberg, Mississippi, and that's on the twenty first, twenty second of November this year, two thousand twenty. Um, we've kind of listened to what all the what everyone's been talking about, what the need for their. I mean, players just struggling to get video and the right sort of advice and stuff like that. So we we we'd hold him one in North America. Got all our staff together. Um, Southern States Soccer Club has uh, kindly agreed to host it. They've got fantastic facilities there. So, and then also Vio, uh, our partners, the camera uh, company, they're going to jump on it as well, uh, help with the footage. So yeah, it's going to be a great weekend. Players come in. They're going to walk away with all the tools, all the knowledge, everything they need to get recruited. Videos, uh, just just the experience of all our staff we've got um guys who've turned pro uh through the draft system and and whatnot so they're going to be there but explaining that sort of thing as well so they're going to walk away with the mind blown but also with the right sort of tools in hand uh, after a couple of days so uh, if you know of anybody who's interested in that where we have spaces available um the website for that is uh www.srusacamp.com that's sirusacamp.com and yeah uh, send them uh, if you know of anyone tell them to go to the website um aside from that um we're all good everyone's healthy um events are starting to roll again uh, especially in the uk which where i'm based out of um and yeah the company uh, is helping a lot of players so that's it i'll keep you i'll keep it uh to that i'll let kim do the talking so this is the Inside College Soccer Podcast. My name is Chris Cousins and I'm interviewing Kim Kambutho. So enjoy. Kim, thank you very much for joining us on the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for having me, Chris. No, it's a, it's, it's, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure always speaking to you, Kim. Um, so a, a lot of people will know about who you are. Uh, a lot of people will not know who you are. So can you just uh, give us a bit of an introduction uh, about who, well, who you are, uh, what you're about, your background, everything about you, and we'll kind of go from there. Wow. It's a long time since somebody asked me that. Um, sure. So I am from Nairobi, Kenya. Um, I have 
played it. I played in the United States for eight years. I played at the academy level. I played at college level, NCAA Division One level, NAIA level. I'm a national champion in 2015. I played um, in the USL. I think it's the USL two now, but it was the PDL back then. Um, and then in 2017, moved back home to Kenya. Since then, I've been helping you know, more African players to attain uh, scholarship opportunities to play in places like the US, um, the SRUSA, of course. And um, yeah, I run, I run True Talents of Africa. I'm also one of the coaches. Um, and we have a program with about 120 students. Um, and yes, I also work with the, the government um, in the Ministry of Sports, um, in talent development. So, uh, yes, that has been my journey. Um, football has been with me since I was a small boy, and it has, it has changed my life, if I'm honest. It has opened doors for me that I never thought would open and um, given me opportunities that, honestly, most people from where I come from don't get. And so I'm very happy to try and help more African student-athletes attain you know, the same kinds of opportunities that I got or even better. So that's yeah, cool. me. I mean, yeah, no, that's, that's in a nutshell. Oh, oh, uh, so <laughs> let's, let's, let's go back then. Let's start from nearly the beginning. Um, born in Nairobi, Kenya, right? Um, you, you, let's, let's fast forward. Like what, 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 when did you start playing football, soccer? Like what, what's the kind of background? Let's, let's get to the early stages and go from there. Sure. Sure. So, I was about, I think the, the first time I remember actually saying, you know, this is something I want to pursue, I was about seven years old. And at that time, my, we didn't really have, you know, organized football. I mean, I was in school and I was playing in school, but there was nothing really organized. And uh, my father used to coach, you know, some of, some of us just, you know, playing even in the estate where, um, where I was staying. And um, yeah, I was, I was in school just, just playing and enjoying myself. Um, started to get a love for the game. Um, I was also a good swimmer, by the way, um, but I, I didn't really like swimming because of all the pressure. So I stopped swimming and just focused more on football. And by the time I was 10 or 11, you know, football was everything in my life um, and all I thought about. So I joined a football academy here in Nairobi, um, started playing more consistently, you know, playing in the school team and winning different awards here and there and, you know, just really trying to find opportunities thereafter because my dream was to play for Arsenal. I used to watch Thierry Henry, Patrick Vieira, um, Dennis Bledkamp. Those were like my biggest idols, you know, growing up. So um, the English Premier League is very popular here in Nairobi. So that was all we, we were exposed to. Um, and that was, that was when I first, I would say, I fell in love with the game and I actually tried to pursue it. So what? So um, let's fast forward a few more years. What? What? When did you start start taking it serious? And like, what led you to kind of head to the US? Because obviously, I know this that you didn't go straight into the college system. You uh, went somewhere before that. So can you tell us a little bit yeah. about that one? So um, I, I started to. I mean, a lot of a lot of I would say African, especially East African players, experience kind of a lack of guidance and a lack of opportunity. Um, I was growing up in Nairobi and playing for many different clubs and it was just not clear, you know, where do I go from here? How do I make it, you know, to London? That was, that was all in my mind. But, you know, at the same time, my parents were thinking, um, okay, this kid, it seems like he's obsessed with this thing. How do we, how do we get him to where he wants to go? And so we were all trying to do research, you know, different kinds of opportunities. Um, and this was in 20, well, 2006. Um, was it 2006? No, it was 2009. 2009, when um, my parents had found out about IMG Academies in, in Florida, in Bradenton. And so my brother and I uh, trained for a while, and then we, we decided to you know, go, go and see how it is there, you know? Um, and we were supposed to go for a soccer camp. It was like a summer camp, you know, all of this was very new to us. And I remember um, when we got there, everything was just like complete. Um, I remember being so anxious, I couldn't even eat before the first day of training. We got there at like uh, 4 a.m. Training was at 8 a.m. the next morning. 
Oh, that was this the I first think. time? Was this the first time you've ever been to the United States? Uh, no, it was the second time. It was the second time, but the first time was a short, like, uh, you know how it, it's different when you go somewhere and you just, you just, maybe you're visiting, you know, some relatives or some friends and then you, then you leave yeah. again. It's different when you actually live. So you had a, yeah, but you had a little bit, little bit of understanding what to expect as a, as a country as a whole. Like some kids who go to the US for the first time, like imagine, imagine you doing that IMG thing without ever visiting the US before. You'd probably be more anxious. Yeah, yeah, true, true. That's true, that's true. And it was also quite um, overwhelming because um, obviously IMG wasn't, isn't what, oh, at that time wasn't what it is now in terms of the size and the magnitude of, of everything. But I just remember seeing, you know, the playing fields and I was like, wow, this is, this is incredible. You know, um, just the infrastructure I had never experienced and nothing like that exists here in Nairobi. Um, I mean, the, the kind of facilities that I would compare it to back then was like the, the National Stadium of Nairobi, which is called Kasarani, which is where the national team plays all the, their games. So that's the only real exposure I had to those kinds of facilities. Um, and so we, we, we did this, this football camp. And um, I mean, from the, first, from the first day, I noticed that, you know, I'm... Um, I'm good. I, I, I can, I can, I can hang with some of those guys who were playing, and uh, of course that gave me more confidence. And as, as time went on, I started to get more confident. Um, and the at the end of those two weeks, you know, some of the coaches said, "Hey, this guy." Uh, where well, they spoke to my parents, and you know, my parents told me, "Hey, they want you to join the full time program." Um, and now it was it was kind of like this was a big, a big investment for my family um, because you know the there was no scholarship financial. offered initially yeah, yeah financial yeah. Yeah. so there was no scholarship offered initially and um it, it would have been a big you know investment for them so they i mean they tell me now in their minds they said okay let him do just one year you know that's what we can do um and then you know maybe he falls out of love with football and goes back home you know at this time by the way i'm only 15 years old so they're trusting me to stay in America on my own at 15. And, uh, and how did you feel about that? How, did you like that or was, was it, did you get homesick? Initially, it was everything I'd ever dreamed of, you know? It was exactly what I wanted. Um, but after a while, you know, I was, you know, looking back now, I realized how it affected me in terms of, you know, how anxious I was all the time because, you know, I'm in, a, I'm in a place where these people are speaking to me. They're speaking English, but I don't understand them. You know, it's, it was just so overwhelming. And I dealt with a lot of anxiety um, to the point where I was like struggling to eat sometimes or before training, I would just, you know, just try and be by myself. I was very quiet. Um, and so that's, that's eventually what happened is I joined the full-time program. Um, and then that's when. Do you mind the, me just jumping began. in there? Sorry, sorry, Kim. Do you mind sure. just jumping in there? You keep mentioning about the anxiety you had and stuff, and yeah, men mental issues is is huge uh, in sport and in in the world right now. But like, can you kind of talk about like how you dealt with that? Because I'm interested to know that you kept you kept saying like, oh, I wouldn't eat. I was really anxious, but now you seem like a calm person. And you, I mean, who knows? But like, what did you do to kind of kind of help yourself through that? Oh man, I don't even, you know, the thing is at that time, mental health isn't something that I was exposed to or even had knowledge of, especially coming from a place like, like Kenya, you don't, I mean, a man is supposed to be a man and you're not supposed to express a lot of emotions and things like yeah, that. Yeah, and it's the same everywhere in the world. <laughs> yeah, true, true. So I'm, I was just having these in fact i didn't know how to define it i i wouldn't define it if you had asked me hey why are you so quiet or why are you at that time i wouldn't be able to say okay this is i'm just feeling really anxious right now the only word i knew how to describe it as was nerves i just felt nervous a lot of the time because i knew i had a lot to prove and okay. this is everything yeah. that i had i had ever asked for so I wanted to. You had, you had a myself. big financial investment. Sorry to interrupt. You had a big financial investment from your parents. Um, you're obviously. Um, it's a different country. There's a lot of there's nerves as well. Just uh, anticipation, but also, yeah, you've got a lot of uh, people make make want, want to make sure you do well, but you you probably couldn't handle the pressure of that straight away. And is that right? Do you say? 
Yeah, exactly. And at the same time, I was in, you see, what I had done here in the in in Kenya, I was in an international school, so I was I was doing the British IGCSE system, which is basically the international version of the GCSE system. Yeah. So when I went to America, I had just finished that system. I just finished my IGCSE exams, and I had. I had um, skipped one year in my education. So I was actually 15 when I finished my IGCSE education. So when I went to America, um, I didn't start in high school. I actually started college classes immediately. So oh, wow. I was doing post-grad courses um, at the University of Miami that was on campus at IMG. I didn't go to the local high school. Right. Um, and so now I'm, I'm in an environment where the people who are my classmates are, you know, three, four years older than me. Um, at the same time, I hadn't matured in myself in terms of, I would say mentally, I'd, I'd matured well enough to the point that my parents could trust me with that kind of responsibility. But I mean, physically, I was still a kid. I was just, a <laughs> uh, and I remember even just in the academy, I remember um, looking at the other guys and all the coaches were saying, Hey, you need to get bigger. You know, you need to get bigger. And so I started to eat a lot of food um, because I was playing as a center back. And of course, you know, size is, is something that matters in the U S. So, you know, just even think about it now, it's just so many things that were thrown at me that um, I'm grateful that I was able to get through. Um, so yeah, there was, there, there was that as well. Are you glad you did? Are you glad you did it? Like, obviously, it's a stupid question. That, so I presume the answer is yes, maybe not. But <laughs> are, you glad, are you glad that you kind of took that step? Is there a, because there'd be a lot of people that would be like, I would love to do that, and even have, maybe have the opportunity, but never do it. Um, and you got to the right. Yeah, I, I would mature, say like young men, young men that I've, that I've come across. <laughs> I would say it was the best decision I ever made in my life. Um, and honestly, if I knew what it was going to entail, I honestly wouldn't, I don't think I would have made that decision because uh, it was a lot for a 15 year old kid. And when I look back on it, um, there's still moments I have now. I mean, in fact, if I'm really open and honest about it, there are moments when I was 23, 24, that I would wake up in the middle of the night and have dreams of, you know, when I was actually leaving my family at 15. So I know that there's, there's a little bit of trauma that I experienced, but it also made me, it made me fit for life after, after the experiences. And that's what I'm really grateful for. That's, that's really interesting. Cause like you say, like you use the word trauma. Sorry, this is turning into a mental uh, health podcast. <laughs> it's just interesting. No, but it's just interesting. Cause obviously I've, I've known you for things like probably five years now. And, um, and, and it's just kind of like never really sp spoke in depth about it. It's just, I've always, I'm always interested to in know how people got to where they are. And it's, it's like, it's like anything I talk about all the time where people like start off, like even people in my, in my hometown, for example, they always talk about, Oh, I wish I did that. I wish I did this, I wish I did that. And then they kind of they never get out of the comfort zone and never really do what they want to do. I mean, coming from, I mean, I've been to Nairobi myself and um, it's, and it, there's obviously a, a lot of places around the world where, um, it's, it's, it's definitely a culture shock from a sense of uh, from what that is to going to do IMG. Uh, so I can imagine, well, I can't imagine, but I can slightly imagine the, the picking you up, landing you there and kind of all the issues that that, that, that would bring. Uh, Cause if you, if you smoothly transitioned into moving to the U S uh, as a 15 year old, <laughs> uh, like Kenyan boy and had, had zero issues. I mean, I'd be very surprised at that. I mean, I can't say <laughs> ever, ever, ever happening. So it's it's obviously good to have, I'm guessing, uh, well, at IMG, they might have had support for you or just kind of, just kind of you, you kind of took it on yourself, uh, your good parents, good family. But there's a lot of kids who might, maybe wouldn't survive that trauma. The trauma is the out of your comfort zone. Uh, that's what I presume it is. And there's, there might be other things as well, but it doesn't, doesn't matter. But um, yeah, so right. Okay, so mo moving on, you're at IMG. Um, you, you, you've, you've finished high school at 15 in a sense because uh the I, I gcse thing um yeah. so what so where's the decision that took you into college How so that um okay initially my first year at img i wasn't i wasn't playing as well, let me talk about the first few months 
um, one of the first, I think within the first month I got injured. Um, I, and then I recovered and slowly over time, because the, there were two teams, there was the academy team and there was another team that was kind of like a B team. And initially I was put on the B team. And um, of course now me as a 15 year old, you know, feeling like I had a lack of confidence in myself. I had all these things that I'm dealing with. And um, of course, you know, in fact, if I'm, I'm really honest about it, you can say that, yeah, I had a good family upbringing, but there were things that I couldn't tell. I couldn't tell my parents um uh, things that i was experiencing because i think that avenue was never was never made available to me um my parents at that time um were very traditional um and just to to see me express emotion that way i don't think i even knew how to so i ended up well you say sorry to jump in there you say traditional i understand what you mean by that but there's not many parents who actively search for um, an opportunity for their kid to move to North America at 15. So you say, you say that, but obviously you've got to look at from that point of view, the very untraditional. Yeah. Yes, true, true. Um, I, think, I think, yeah, for that I give them credit too because they, they were very much... Um, my parents come from, in fact, if you ask them, I don't know if they would say it, but they come from the village, you know, they they are the ones who moved to Nairobi and made lives for themselves here in Nairobi. And um, my dad was very much the type of person who would say, I didn't have shoes until I was 10 years old. You know, you should be grateful. You're just spoiled kids. You know, all <laughs> it was just a very, um, it's a very interesting upbringing that I had. Um, but I'm very grateful for my parents because they had, they, they, I think they came from a background where they just wanted to provide everything for us. Um, in the best way that they could um, because they had experienced lack in their lives. So in that sense, yes, I, I think I owe them hard, the world. Hard. That's why you find a lot of parents will work hard. Sorry, did you hear that? <laughs> no, I, I didn't hear that. No, I just said that's, what, that's why um, like parents work hard to ho hopefully give a better life to the kids. And that's what your parents did. Yeah, yeah. I think the one the one area that we never really navigated as a family was how how do myself and my brother as young men, how do we express our emotions? How do we say when we're struggling with things? Because um we were expected to be to be very good at everything. Um and it's still something that I address with them now. But anyway, that's 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 how it was for me. So when I was in IMG and um you know, things maybe weren't going the right way. You know, I, I didn't know how to express all of those things. But at the end of my first year, um, of course, things got better because I really worked hard. Um, and just the avenue was presented for me to put in the work. And because I can also say that because it meant more to me than some, some of my teammates, because, you know, some of them, they were staying, you know, in Florida. You know, it was, practice was just 20 minutes drive from their home. For me, I was, miles away from my home so the opportunity was just so big that i couldn't i couldn't waste time and so at the end of the first year i started playing for the academy team and um and i started to develop you know in in in, in a consistent way so second year was more of the same i just kept on playing and developing in my last year i played for the under 18 academy team which was kind of like the the flagship team of the academy and um I was playing well, um, I was playing okay. I, I would say we had quite a good team. Um, in fact, Marlon Hairston, I, I don't know if you would know him, but uh, he went to Louisville, is now playing for Minnesota um, in the MLS. Um, he also played at uh, Colorado Rapids. He was one of my teammates. Um, there is Pablo Aguilar, who used to play at, um, I think it was, it wasn't FC Dallas, it was Houston. Um, he played in Houston in the MLS. Um, he had gone to, I don't remember where he went to college. But we had a team of those kinds of players, you know. I think out of the 11 on the team um, that graduated, or the number that graduated, I know a lot of us went Division I, um, uh, including me. So it was a very competitive environment and a very competitive team. 
just, to, um, just to interrupt there, sorry. Like, so you, you just, yeah. Kim, just to ju just to interrupt. Them, them players you mentioned who are now at the MLS, did you ever see anything? So they're playing, they're playing professionally. Did you ever see anything in them that were like, wow, they're going to make it? Or were any surprises, any sort of traits, uh, any sort of any strengths? Did you think, do you see their names on, um, on the rosters of these MLS sides and go, wow, how did they make it? What's, tell us what you think. Um, no, I think I think it's of course it's different for every player, but in the moment when I was playing with those guys, yes, we knew that they were good. But if you compared Marlon or Pablo with any of the other players on our team, there wasn't that much difference when it comes to their technical ability. Where they won was in in their mindset. Um, we had a coach who was. Um, he he would just destroy you. You make a mistake, he, you know. He he'll shout from the sideline. He would just. It, it was there was a lot of pressure, but what players like Pablo and players like um, like Marlon were able to do is just shut shut everything off and just enjoy or look as if they're enjoying and just playing football. Whereas me, I'm I'm very much a thinker. You know, I think about things and I'm evaluating everything and sometimes overthink things. Um, and some of the some of the other players on the team were like that. And in that environment, we just we didn't we didn't excel as well as they did. Um, who who's but, the coaches? We, we can be, it's an open forum. Who who were the coaches there at the time? Who do you have? Um, we had Scott Dean and Scott Bowers. Um, Scott Dean, I think, now runs the whole football academy. I think he's maybe the technical director. I'm not sure. Yeah. But I realized, I realized what he was trying to do and why he was so hard on us is he really prepared me for, for life in college, um, playing for a competitive team. Um, because, I mean, the amount of pressure he would put on us is, I would say, even in, in my first year at Oral Roberts University, where I eventually went, it wasn't, I mean, I didn't have that much pressure. So, I mean, as an under-18 player, I'm having more pressure than I would in college. And um, that, I, I think there was some, definitely some method to all the madness that we experienced. Um, and I'll be grateful to him for that. So in my final year, um, I remember in January having no offers or anything like that. Um, even in February, nothing had come my way. Um, at that time, I was still battling for a lot of playing time with some of the other players. Um, and I would say I never really actively went out searching for help. Um, I remember at the time there was this, I think it was called NSCA or something. I, I don't even remember what it was called. They, they used to help people get recruited into college teams. Yeah, the, um, online, pl the online platform. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, but I was, I was just, I was still trying to understand everything. So, um, I basically created my own highlight video um, from the videos that I had. Um, and I created, yeah, basically put the, the, the video out there and sent emails to many different, I think I sent it to every single division one team I could find. Um, and so why, did, really... why, why, why only division one? Cause you're not, it's not like you're in the uh, outside of the U S right now. So then right now you're emailing coaches, just division one coaches. What made you not email? top division two, top NAIA. I'm interested in all that process. You know, I've, I've never really thought about that, but I think at the time that was all we were exposed to. You know, um, Marlon had signed early to Louisville. Um, there was another player on our team called Joey who was going to, I don't remember what team, it was a division one team in Florida. And it was just like, yo, you have to go division one. You have to go division one. There was no, um, of course, at the end of it, you know, you realize, oh, wait, some of my teammates are actually going to, you know, good Division two schools, you know, and, and end up with just the same amount of opportunities. Or All of my experience of NIA only came after. But when I was in the thick of college recruitment and trying to do things myself, I only thought about Division one because, of course, I also had a big head, you know. I was saying <laughs> I have to go there because that's, that's where I should be, you know. Yeah. Um, but who knows what would have happened if I, you know, I pushed some of the top division two teams, because once I finally got the experience of playing, um, in division one and experiencing division two and NAIA, 
I mean, I, I looked at some of those teams and I was thinking, wow, this is really just like something that's put in your face. But really when you're in it, some of those teams in Division Two and NAIA are much better than, than Division One teams. And that's what actually happened um, when I went to Oral Roberts. So I finished, you know, trying to send out all these emails and everything and nothing really came my way. Um, at the time, I was also, I was doing very well academically. Um, I think I had, I had something like a 3.6 GPA or something, and this is in college classes. So I was actually applying as a transfer student. So how, opposed, how old are you right now? Is this at 16 or what? No, this is 18. I'm 18 now. Oh, so you, you've been at IMG for a, number, a few years now? Yeah, for three years I was at IMG. All right, sorry, sorry I missed that. So, so this, is, <laughs> this is the end of my uh, my end of my third year. So when I'm yeah. when I'm about to you know get to college, and so yeah, I was applying as a transfer student. So I had gotten academic scholarships from different places. I had gotten an academic scholarship from American University. Um, um i can't even remember some of these other places I, I i just don't remember but because i was just so focused on football at the same time the university of tampa was very interested was interested in me and so i had gone for an official visit there um i think at the time they were doing quite well in division two so it was considered you know a good program and i had experienced how things were there it was a very nice campus and um, the teammates, the team was very nice to me, um, but it didn't give me the feel or the same feel of, you know, I can play here and then go professional. It, it seemed like um, they weren't as serious, you know, about how they're pushing things. Granted, I went in the spring when, you know, the season isn't in full uh, motion. So I, I didn't really, there's something about it that didn't, I guess I, I wasn't fascinated by. Um, but in, I think it was Dallas Cup. It was the Dallas Cup in, that was 2012, I believe, when um, the All Roberts coach um, approached me and he said, hey, we're interested in you. And, you know, after that, after that, I kind of just followed up. And All Roberts was the only Division One team that um, the coach was actively recruiting me. So... That's where I wanted to go because I thought, you know, Division One is great. So that's what I did is I went, I went to All Roberts and I, I got a scholarship and I played there for my first year. Do you, um, think, do you think that you chose All Roberts over Tampa because of the D1 status? Yeah, for sure. I knew that really? was it. Yeah, because I, I had selected All Roberts without even doing the visit. Um, oh, I did. The, right, okay. I did. The, okay. I did the, well, did the visit after I selected. Well, let's just let's just say right. You can go back in time right now, and this is nothing wrong with Oral Roberts. Uh, I've had a number play, number of players go there, and um, it's a good place. But what if you looked at Tampa and Oral Roberts on the table right now, and you've done visits for both of them? Uh, what would you still go with Oral Roberts, or would you go with Tampa? I'm just interested to know the truth. Oh man, you know the thing is, uh, all Roberts. Once I was in, um, there were many things wrong with that program. And granted, now the new coaching staff that came in a year after, in fact, it was the same year. They came in the same year when, you know, the coach that was there during my season left, and they have kind of transformed the program because now I think they're a top thirty, top forty team. Um, but at the time. I remember going in, you know, preseason was what it was. It was tough, of course, but I was coming from IMG where I felt like I was, I was ready for that kind of thing. And, you know, even in my first year, I, I, I couldn't play because I wasn't, I wasn't cleared by the NCAA. So right. when I was eventually cleared, they gave me, they gave me one year. It, it was actually two years to play because I was applying as a transfer student. Um, and so what they did is they started my college clock at 15. So they, in their minds, I had already played three years of college soccer. So this is me as an 18 year old coming in as a freshman yeah. and they're telling me you only have one year to play. Yeah. And so now this is all of the things I was finding out during the season. 
So I was not able, to, I never actually got onto the field. I would, you know, of course, take trips and everything, but we were trying to appeal for them to give me more years. At the same time, I don't want to use my year so that, you know, I, I lose my eligibility. So I wasn't able to play. Um, but I, w I was playing really well and um, things were going, I mean, on terms of my performance, I was doing really well. And at the end of that season, when I came back in the spring, um, well, let me just say that the team was not doing well at all. Um, I think we, we lost a lot of games. Um, the coach that was there wasn't very good. Um, the team needed to be restructured. And so the coach left um, and we got a new coach in the spring season and things started to change. So when things started to change, of course, the new coaching staff came in and they, you know, offered me a position to stay. But now, you know, I told them about my situation with the, with the NCAA and, you know, it's, it's kind of, I had a choice to make. Either I stick with the NCAA and play Division One for one more year or I can try and go to an NAIA team where now I would get, you know, three years of eligibility. So of course the, the choice was a no brainer and I had emailed many different coaches in the NAIA. I did the same process. You know, I created a highlight video for myself and sent it out to um, the top 20 NAIA teams. Um, and the team that replied to me was Bellhaven University and they were national champions. Um, there were other teams that replied to me as well, but I mean, if, if, if in my mind I said, okay, I'll go and play for the national champions because apparently they're the best team in the NAIA. And that's, that's what Easy I did. That, right? <laughs> <laughs> I spoke to, I spoke to the coach and he was like, uh, you know, let's, uh, we want you here. You know, this is what we're prepared to offer you. It was a better scholarship than the one I had at all Roberts. And I was like, okay, you know, I never considered that it was in Mississippi. I didn't. There's many things I didn't think about that I didn't know. And I, I almost wish that I had the guidance, but of course, hindsight is twenty twenty. but I mean, I'm grateful for those experiences yeah. that I had. Um, and so I moved to Belhaven University. So you, you now you fought four or five years into the U S experience and you still got still doing this alone. Like I, I, I knew when you said like, um, you finished your IGCSEs at 15. That um, that's if you started the college classes, that's your your timer starting from from there. But if you if you'd have done like high school, um, you could have just extended your graduation day. And obviously, that's boring stuff about the job. But <laughs> that's why that's why I've got a job. But like, I'm surprised that the IMG guys that didn't know that. I'm not kind of putting any blame on them. I'm just saying. I'm just wondering. Like, no one really picked up on that. Even the even the college. Uh, Oral Roberts coach didn't know that before you came in like if you're a transfer student you obviously started your timer and it's obvious when you started your timer and how long you got left it's pretty pretty simple really um and the NCAA is it's, it's difficult to navigate it's re I mean you've kind of experienced it for yourself but also like players like for example Andrew Namero and stuff like that we've kind of dealt with um client wise but um you've seen what the even the NAIA is difficult as well but it's a little bit more lenient. So that's why you've gone there. You've gone and you're now at uh, NAIA. Uh, and then the journey starts there. You, you, you start playing straight away or how was that? Um, let me also say that I just wish I knew these things earlier because, you know, from my parents' perspective, they're thinking, wait, our son can start college early. Oh, he's a genius, you know. Let him do it. Let him try. Let's see, you know. Maybe this yeah. is, you know, if he does well, he'll go to Harvard, you know. That's how a parent is thinking um, without the guidance of actually, you know, if he starts college now, his college clock is going to start and it's going to limit him from opportunities in the future. Nobody said anything about that. Nobody which said find, anything. Which I find crazy that. actually. They didn't say anything about that until I was in all Roberts um, halfway through the season and they're talking about let's send appeals to the NCAA and now I'm here just praying you know because I don't know what's going to happen to, to my career at that point I don't know if I'm ever going if I'm going to play I don't know what you know so anyway I was just grateful that you know I finally found a place that I could play and you know they were excited to have me at Belhaven um, and so I went to Belhaven and the experience there was um, it was very interesting because um, 
His name is Brian Mac 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 Man. Call Mac. Everyone calls him. <laughs> yeah, Coach Mac. I call him. Yeah, he's Coach Mac, and he's he's he honestly he's an amazing coach, and um, he's now at Palm Beach Atlantic, and they're doing great things there, and um, I'm very happy for him um, because I know you know it seems like out of all the coaches I had, he was one of them that. I think his concepts and his teachings kind of stayed with me. But in that year, he had actually recruited, um, there were 70 players on the team. Um, 70, 70. 70 players on the team. And okay. um, they had just been national champions. So um, he was basically recruiting some of the best talent that, you know, international players. I don't think... We didn't have a lot of Americans on that team. Most of the guys were just internationals. And so I go there, um, and the first week of preseason is just to separate the first team and the reserve team. And uh, thankful to God that I made the first team, and you know I actually managed to get myself a starting place on the team. Um, what I would say is that was one of the hardest periods of my career, simply because things outside of the football field were not going well for me. Um, I was, I was in my mind, I was thinking, you know, I'm going to go to this place and then maybe I'll be in a dormitory with all the other, you know, students or all the other players in my team. And that was not the case. Um, you know, we were, many of the, my teammates were staying off campus in their own places. I was staying on campus by myself with a roommate that really was never around and was not a member of the football team or soccer team, sorry. Um, and so I spent a lot of nights like just alone, you know, in my head and just not really anybody around me. And um, I think it started to show, especially um, during the first few weeks of the season when, you know, you get a starting spot and then um, I started to make mistakes on the field and, you know, things weren't going right for me. And um, I eventually lost my starting spot. And, and yeah, now I just started to serve my role from the bench. Um, and I think it was because of all these things that I was dealing with. Um, at the same time, Mississippi wasn't the best environment for me to be around, um, I would say. But I guess it's part of the journey. Um, but no, once tell I finished me more. that... Tell me more. Give me some more information about that. Um, I just felt very isolated. I felt as if, you know, I'm, 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 playing, I'm playing a match, you know, maybe I haven't played well. And then I just go back to my own room and I'm by myself and I'm just there. You know, I go to class by myself. You know, that's where I meet my teammates. My teammates at the same time, there the, the wasn't like, um, you know, in, in different colleges, maybe I'd say at all Roberts we had, you know, you're staying on the same floor with all the soccer players, you know, and then the soccer players come and they invite you to everything. You know, you go to eat together, you go to class together, you, you, you're just always hanging out. So of course you, you build friendships that way. And it just felt like Kim is this outsider um, who is a good player, um, but um, he doesn't really have, you know, friends on the team. Um, and I just, I, maybe part of it was also me not engaging that well with my teammates, but I just, it was just a difficult environment for me. Um, yeah. yeah. Sometimes so, it's not right for people. Yeah. It's good that you, and at the time, was it getting you down or were you fine with it or what? It got me down, but you see at the same time, you, um, playing and, and the coaches kept me up because they, you know, they were, I think they saw something in me and they were thinking the, the, the player who eventually took my spot was a senior, you know, he's, I think he was about 25 years old, to be honest. Um, <laughs> and, and he had, he had played in the national, in the national championship team the year before. So um, I think in their minds, they were like, okay, let him teach Kim how, you know, how to do this thing so that when he, um, next year and the year after that, you know, he can eventually get his his chance. So it was still very much, I'd say, my experience in America in terms of the top teams is when you're a sophomore, it's still very much, um, hey, we're, we're, you're in this team, but you are, you still have a few more years left. You know, you still have time to develop. You still have, so um, if there's a senior playing ahead of you, it's really not that bad. Um, you find you find a lot of players. You find a lot of players who turn professional, 
don't play many minutes in the freshman sophomore years. Yeah, yeah, um, and I think that is also just adapting to the environment because it's, I mean, it's different for everyone. It's different for everyone. Um, so yeah, I, I experienced that first season, and um, we made it to the national tournament. And in the last sixteen, we lost, um, and then we were back in 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 Mississippi. And that spring, um, you know, Coach Mack has a meeting with all of us. It's one of the first meetings of the whole semester, and he tells us the school has decided to go NCAA Division three, and he's leaving to Palm Beach Atlantic. And I mean, it, it was just, you can imagine 60 plus players just being like, wow, I mean, this is it for us. We, uh, I think many of the top players, I'd say the guys who were playing in the first team, it was very much like, okay, we have to go somewhere else. Because it was, I mean, we knew once, you know, we just thought in our minds, if we're going to play NCAA Division Three we don't really think the opportunities are going to come our way. When you say um, opportunities, you mean professional? Yeah, professional opportunities. And many of the guys there were, we were there because that's, that was our aspiration. Um, and uh, these are a lot of international players who, who are there to, to make it, essentially. We're not there to get necessarily just an education or, you know, we're, we're there to try and make a life for ourselves through football. So... Once he says that, it just becomes like a mass exodus of players. <laughs> um, I I started I did the same process again. You know I I <laughs> made <video> for my <laughs> on, the, on the move again. <laughs> yes, I made a video for myself, a highlight video. I sent it out to you know <laughs> all the top twenty NIE colleges. And at this point, you know I had some experience. You know I was coming from IMG. I played NCAA Division One and. I had played for the national champion um, team. Um, so it was very easy. And in fact, uh, Coach Mack was willing to help me. So I got recruited by the University of Rio Grande. Um, and that was Coach Scott Morrissey and Tony Daniels. Um, and that's what I did is I, is I, over the course of, in fact, you know what's crazy? I actually got recruited by Mid-America Nazarene and the University of Rio Grande. And two years later, we met in the national championship final. So it's kind of like, regardless of which one I chose, we may have still ended up you know, playing against each other. Yeah. But I, I basically went on a visit. I, went to a, I, I took one trip and I went, I went first to the University of Rio Grande in Ohio. I played, you know, a training, had a training session with them. Um, spent the night there. In the morning, I traveled to Kansas City. I was picked up by, by, by the coach, and I played a, a training session with Mid America Nazarene, and then stayed the night there. And then the following morning, went back to to Mississippi. So this time, I think I was more cautious in terms of let me go and visit these places first before I make a decision. You know, and I was contemplating everything in my mind. Um, they gave me two different offers. They weren't that different. Um, and, you know, both of them were, were very good scholarships. So I ended up selecting the University of Rio Grande simply because I felt like they had, I think at the time it was because I felt like they had a more professional team. I could, I could point out to several players on that team and say those guys are, are real are really good, you know, whereas Mid-America Nazarene, I think they were still trying to rebuild and it didn't feel like so much of a professional environment. And so that's where I went. You know, this whole time as well, I'm playing in the summer. So I was playing PDL for my first year at All Roberts. I played at uh, Springfield Demise, which was in, in Missouri. Um, my second year, I went and played NPSL with, um, San, in San Antonio. Um, that was before I joined the University of Rio Grande. And how, did you, how, did you, how did you play in the summer? Just to kind of digress for one second. How did you get the opportunities? I did the same process. <laughs> I made myself a video and I sent, I sent it to all these different people. Um, the Springfield one, I actually went for a tryout. Um, the, the San Antonio one, um, you know, once you're playing well, in a college team, my experience is that some of the coaches can really help you find an opportunity. 
And so it was just one phone call that um, Coach Tim, who was there at the time, made a call and put me, um, and just put my name up in one of these teams. And yeah, I was given housing and I was, you know, playing for that team for that summer. Um, and I had, I, had, I had some good seasons. It's just that we, we didn't, let's say I wasn't playing in the best division um, in the PDL. So it wasn't like all the eyes were on us anyway. But it was good experience because it now prepared me to go to the University of Rio Grande. And so I went there and it's very much in the middle of nowhere, but the team is very much together um, all the time, simply because of where you are. You know, everybody's staying on campus. It's just, it's a nice environment, I would say. And my first year, you know, I earn a starting spot on the team. I start playing. Um, eventually, I think um, we made it to, we were ranked number one, actually, for most of the season. Um, and halfway through the first, my first season there, I started not playing as well as I should have. I think if, if, if I could say, if I could look back on my career, it was always a battle with my own self-confidence. Um, sometimes I would be the biggest player on the field, but perform, you know, in a small way. And it just kept on reflecting. I would always go to a team, preseason is great, you know, earn a starting spot. And then somewhere along the line, um, I wouldn't play as well as I should have. Um, and so... Anyway, we reached the. How did the that affect you? you so, you, so you didn't play well. How, I'm sorry, I keep turning this into a mental thing, but how, like, how, how you, as a, as a person, obviously, you're affected by a bad uh, performance. So, what what did yeah. you do? What what happened is kind of like it went spiral. I like play bad, and you think about it, overthink about it, and you're training, and you got too much pressure on yourself to try and redeem yourself. Is that what happens? Yeah, um, you know, in fact, I can I can even go deeper because I I. Of late, especially during during this quarantine period, I decided to see a counselor. And it wasn't because there was anything particularly wrong with me. It was simply because I wanted to try it. And so, you know, I, I approached yeah, yeah. it quite, uh, pushed it quite, um, not in a very serious manner, you know. And I remember thinking before I saw the counselor if she would even understand me, you know. Um, but... I kid you not, in the first 30 minutes, she had kind of summed up my whole life and I started to see things in a completely different way. And what she, what she told me or what, what, we, what I learned about myself during that process was that when I was younger, between the ages of zero and six, I was, that's when most you know, people's character is developed. My parents were not around a lot and um, I was always... At the same time, my brother and I, we used to compete for everything. So I was very much trying to earn the attention of my parents. And what happened was I found football as a way of giving me what my parents couldn't, which is that love from, from the outside world. So I, football became a tool that I used to get love directed at me. And that later reflected in my career because... I would play so that I can earn that from other people. Um, and that's why I think I took it. I used to add a lot of pressure on myself because I knew that if I didn't play well, it wasn't just, hey, you didn't play well. It's you're not loved. You're not. Now there's nothing about you that is praiseworthy or, or, or lovely about you. Um, and I only realized that now. <laughs> at 26 years of age which is just the other day Inter no it's interesting it, a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of this sort of thing does come back to parents uh you find i mean i've personally never been to a therapist or anything like that and um but you hear a lot of stories where it's kind of it stems from that it doesn't mean your parents are bad people just everyone's different and no if everyone was the same in the world it'd be a boring world so everyone's got to turn out different and some people do handle it better some people don't some people can kind of decipher what's what the issues are and some people need someone to tell them and it's good that you kind of found that out because you can kind of look back and go oh yeah that makes sense <laughs> yeah yeah um and i think thanks for, thanks for telling me that by the way that's good i appreciate it no no i think i think it's important to share because i i know that a lot of footballers deal with this kind of thing especially when it comes to 
let's say you for some reason one or another you have to you know cut your career short or something and all you know is football because that's the only place you've put your identity in it's really difficult um you know you you end up having a lot of anxiety and stress because football is all you know so i think it's important if more footballers said these kinds of things because um i think at the end of the day football is a tool we won't have it forever nobody plays a career until they until they die you know it's usually something you use to achieve something else and for me it was to achieve the the love and respect of people around me that i felt i couldn't get as a small boy um so i'm not saying it's like that for every player but i i sense that for a lot of players there is something behind it that pushes them beyond the limit that i mean to do irrational things like leave your home at 15 years old and navigate america alone um but i only realize that now and um i guess i'm i'm still i'm still thankful for that um and i don't blame my parents in any way because um i mean at the end of the day they did their best um and i'm very grateful for them um so that's where i would say that my that lack of confidence came from is when i performed badly I wasn't thinking this was all happening subconsciously but I wasn't thinking oh this is just a bad game tomorrow I can have a better game I was thinking no now I've lost the love that you know it, it all reflected back to to my childhood um and so it hurt me deeper than it would hurt most players um and that's why I think I started to spiral sometimes during the mid part of the season so <clears throat> let me go back to um the season my first season at, at the university of rio grande where we were ranked number 1 going into the national tournament and we lose the first game in the national tournament and we're knocked out by the host of the tournament and it was really really demoralizing um it was it was just a a bad experience for all of us um the good thing was that many of us were coming back the following year and that's what we did is we just made sure that we came back stronger so that year i went to florida that's where i met you and um i th- i would say we had quite a good season in terms yeah, of sorry about that of how we played um i don't know how you would det- you would say that season went uh, yeah well i mean look i i i was brought i was brought in <sighs> uh i mean i can say i can say all this now because it doesn't it makes no difference to me but there was there's a lot of false pretenses like there was a lot of like the ownership just unrealistic in everything um they had a ceo who was just uh unbelievably uh egotistical and had no idea about anything you had a head coach who yet yeah, played at um at, at played at a good level was knowledgeable but was Oh, it, it was. It, it couldn't pass. It couldn't pass that information across uh, without spending an hour doing it. When whereas people who were trained and qualified would take five minutes to do it, he'd take an hour to do it. So then the players that I had in were pretty good, and this, there was a good overall team. Um, but there were just there were things that weren't for me. weren't one hundred percent. But yeah, to answer your question, there was a there was a good team and. They did pretty well. I mean, it could have been better. Yeah, I think that's one thing that we got from that season. Is yeah, things could have been better. But um, I, I always thought, you know, okay, there's one more season I have of college. Let me go back and make sure that this is the best, you know, that I can make it. So I went back now as a senior, and um, same same thing happened actually. You know, you start performing well, you get a starting spot, and then spiral out and um it <laughs> starts not playing as well as i should have um though what happened was this is crazy actually thinking about it now towards the end of the regular season um i kind of just said you know what i'm tired of you know making football matter so much because i was i was getting to a point where i was having sleepless nights because I wasn't, you know, playing as well as I could have and I couldn't understand it. You know, it was very much before before that season had started, it was very much like, you know, Kim is coming to start, Kim is coming to play, be one of the leaders on the team and it just couldn't make that happen. And it was becoming really frustrating for me. And 
I just decided, okay, if this is my last time playing college soccer, let me just enjoy it. And that's exactly what I did. I just tried to enjoy it as much as possible. I, I, started, even, I started playing as a striker, actually, um, because one of the coaches said, hey, you know, maybe you want to try. And so I started playing there in training, started scoring goals, because in my mind, I was like, I'm just going to have fun. You know, and I think it was the first time in, in a really long time that I had actually just said, you know what, let me just have fun playing football. I kind so of you, so when, just football. to jump in there, Kim. So when by this point there, you're saying I, you, I'm going to have fun. Are you now saying I'm not going to turn professional? I'm giving up on kind of taking things really serious and doing an extra ten percent. I'm just going to have fun. Is that right, or are you still believing there's an, there's opportunities afterwards? No, I was still like, there's, very, there's opportunities after. It's just a current period in my life where I need to, I need to, perf- I just need to, I just need to enjoy it. And, you know, once the season is over, then I can, you know, go look for these different opportunities. But for now, you know, why not just enjoy? And so I started playing more often. I was coming off the bench. I think the last eight games leading up to the national tournament, the final, I had scored, I think, four or five goals. So I was coming off the bench and, you know, like having a good time. I, I even stopped being anxious about games. I was, just, <laughs> I was just, I was really just enjoying myself. And, you know, the, the crazy thing is when I was playing in Kenya, that's where, that's where I used to play. I used to play as a striker. So it started to remind me of the, the times when I used to really enjoy football. and. Yeah, so we go into the national tournament. We're ranked number one again. And this time, it's kind of like everybody is focused. You know, everybody knows what to expect. Everybody, it was the same venue. Um, and I think we didn't concede a goal the whole, the whole uh, of, the, of the national tournament. Um, we played the first game. We won 2-0. I scored in that game. Um, the second game, we won 3-0. Um, and now we're in the... I think that was the semis. Yeah, it was. It must have been the semis. We're in the semis, and we play a really good. It was um, Missouri Valley. They were a really good team, and they took us to almost took us to overtime, but we managed to score. And then we're in the final, and it's Mid American Nazarene against University of Rio Grande. You know, and it's a big game, and I honestly think they played better than us. I honestly do. We started to get some injuries, so. Um, I was playing a lot at that point, you know, as a striker. And um, at the same time, you know, you're tired, you're... <laughs> they took us to overtime. So now, you know, I start the overtime and I'm playing and, I mean, everybody's just so tired. And I remember that time there was... That game, there was just... The wind was so strong, um, so much so that um, if you're playing against it, you almost couldn't get out of your own half. So we decided in the first half of overtime, that we are going to play with the wind to see if we can, you know, get a goal. And when we go onto the field, Mid America actually plays better than us. I think they even struck the bar, um, and nobody had even gone that close to scoring against us. So we're all now thinking, "Whoa, okay, this is serious." Um, <clears throat> and then we get a free kick um, with five minutes left in the first half of overtime. And uh, my teammate Jeremy the Hoog from <laughs> from Holland, he steps up to take the free kick. I go in the box. We're all in the box, you know. I'm thinking we just need a goal, you know. And I'm I'm quite a big person, so I'm thinking if he can get this on my head, maybe you know I can score. I was trying to visualize everything in my head, and he goes for goal, and he hits it. This is from I think 30 yards or something. It's just crazy. There's a video of it as well. And it just flies into the top corner. You know, I was looking at it and I'm thinking, wait, where is it going? Where is it going? It's not a cross, you know. And halfway through the flight of that ball, I'm thinking the keeper is not going to get that ball. And it just flew into the top corner and the game is over. And at that point, it was just like, I, I couldn't believe it. Everybody just couldn't. You know, everybody just rushes off the bench. Everybody's crying. Everybody's, it's just crazy. And that's, that's a moment that. that I'll, yeah, that's a moment I'll share with my teammates that I honestly will never forget. So then yeah. that happens. What, 
what happens after all after all that then what's what's tell us a little bit about the next steps so i'll try and i'll try and move a bit faster through the next part so that um, cool. um <laughs> i feel like this story is so long hey, so we, people, we finished people that. interested <laughs> the, we finished the 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 regular season national champions we come back you know we're celebrated we end up going to like um, the Columbus Crew Stadium, we end up going to FC Cincinnati Stadium and like people just, you know, celebrating us everywhere. And it's a great experience um, for, for us. Um, but at the same time, I'm thinking, okay, I want to pursue professional opportunities. So I started looking for different ways and there was two combines that I went to. Um, a combine is like a trial. Um, I know you know, but maybe some people may not know. So I went for the info sport combine. I think you know it. Chris, you there? Say that bit again. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, I, I went for the info sport combine. I think you know it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I was on mute. I was yeah. trying to speak, but <laughs> <laughs> no, no wait. Um so yeah, the the I went for for this combine and it's it's one that I think it's infamous it's not people tell you don't go other people tell you you know maybe you should just try it but I said okay let me just try and go and it was in Florida um it was basically in fact it was a month after the national tournament so I I came home to Kenya and went back almost immediately I didn't stay for long um so at, at that point I was coming back around once a year maybe once every one and a half years to see my family. Um, but I went back to, to take part in that combine. It went quite well for me, to be honest, because I was selected in the, there's, what they do is they have like, I mean, there were so many players there, I think around 300 players and you're just put in many different teams and you're watched over three days. And on the last day I was put into the the select team. So it's the best of, all the players that are there and you know all the scouts come to watch those games so I was put into that unfortunately um, nothing really came from it I think I got maybe a bit of interest but they were asking for a US passport or a green card so it was my first time experiencing this whole you know limit on international players within the US and I think it's something that I only really understood at that point um, that if I'm not a US citizen or if I don't have a uh, a U.S. passport or a green card, it's actually harder for me to play in the U.S. And so I started looking for other opportunities. I went for a soccer visa trial. Um, I'm sure, I don't know if you know um, Joe and soccer visa. Chris. I know soccer visa, but I don't know the, the people behind it. Uh, okay, so I, I went for this one in Florida. And honestly, I would say I was one of the best players there, but I kind of took it with a big head and I didn't perform. I didn't, I didn't make it known, you know, I was just performing at where I should have performed. I, I think I could have done a lot better, but um, nothing came from that. And so I, in the summer, now I go back to Florida, I go back to Southwest Florida Adrenaline and play PDL one again. And so that PDL season didn't go well for the team, but for myself, I was selected as an all conference player. Um, and so I'm thinking, okay, I've won a national championship, you know, I was selected in the InfoSport Combine in the select team. I've been selected as an all-conference player um, in the PDL. You know, now I should get something, you know, at least something in my head. Should, not, yeah, something should. You, you'd think so, right? Yeah, but nothing. I mean, I, I got like, I, I would always have enough to get through the door in terms of I could speak to the coaches because I would send them, this is my CV. You know, this is this is my video. This I mean, at that point, I have so many videos. I have, I had everything in terms of of what you would think one would need. You know, and just nothing was happening because they kept coming back with, "Do you have a U.S. passport or a green card?" And I, I didn't. Um, and but so, you know what? I'm gonna jump. I'm gonna jump in there on that one, right? People, uh, people really underestimate the fact you've got to create like a profile of yourself during college. Like everyone. Everyone turns professional. Aren't necessarily the best players. Obviously, a lot of them are good players, but it's kind of like people who just everyone knows about. It's kind of like you have to have a profile, and it's very rare that somebody like that no one's ever heard about. I understand that if you're a good player, people will know about you naturally, but it's just um, 
you got the you got the the visa and the passport situation against you, right? But a lot of teams, if you're good enough, they'll get you on as a international player. Simple, really. Um, yeah. Yes, it's easier if you're a US uh, passport or a green card. Um, if you graduate with college, you can do the OPT thing, and like I don't know, kind of go from that sort of way. But um, yeah, there's there's lots of different ways of doing it. If I'm a firm believer, if you're good enough, you're meant to be. And then sometimes it's just not the right place. Uh, I mean, America might not be the right place for you. you you've got a good period there. And who to, to be honest with you, I found it a shame that you never got anything in the States. But what can we do? We can't go back in time. It's, it's, we have to learn from this sort of thing. Yeah, you know, I, I agree with you completely. And I think one of the realizations I had to make during that time was um, I had to tell myself, hey, Kim, they're not selecting you, not because you don't have a... a a green card or a US passport is because you're not good enough. And once I kind of accepted that, I started to work much harder. And I, I worked um, hard thinking that, okay, now I have to, be, have to be better than the Americans that are around me. And so I got two trials at, in November of 2016. And in my mind, I told myself, hey, these are the last two trials that I'll, I'll have as a player. Because I know at this point, I've tried everything, you know? Um, in my mind, that's how I was thinking. Um, these are the last two trials. I'll prepare for them. Um, and let's just see where this goes. If I turn professional from this, great. If I don't, at least I can rest my head at night and say, you know, I did the most with the talent that I had. And so I went for, um, it was with Sporting Kansas City. It was an invitational trial. Um, and I went there. Um, again, <clears throat> roughly about 50 players there. We played over two days. In fact, what the crazy thing is, <laughs> um, I, I went for this trial at Sporting Kansas City, which was on a Saturday and Sunday. At the same time, I had signed up for, I was invited to a soccer visa trial um, that was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So what I did is I went for the Sporting Kansas City trial, played the first day and the second day. At the end of the second day, I... I rushed home, packed all my bags, went to the airport and traveled to Connecticut um, to play in the soccer visa trial. And I got to Connecticut around, I think, 11 p.m. at night. I couldn't rent a car because I was too young. So there was somebody I was supposed to meet there. His flight came in around midnight. We had a problem getting the rental car. We eventually got it around, I think it must have been like 1.30 a.m. And then drove us to, we drove to Danbury, which is about two hours. I ended up sleeping at 4 a.m. And the trial was starting at 8 a.m. <laughs> in, in that same morning. So it's just, I say this because I think um, a lot of people think the journey um, is somehow very formalized and very, you know, you play well and you do this with, um, in my experience, it was very much like you earn the opportunities and, you know, it's rough. It's not, it's not how you expect it to be. And I didn't get anything from the Sports in Kansas City trial. Um, any feedback? I didn't get, in fact, I didn't get any feedback at all. I think I, sp I spoke with the center back who played next to me because I, I knew that we both played well in the first, um, the first, the first day. On the first day, I would say that him and I were probably some of the better center backs there. Um, and he was invited to preseason. I wasn't. And I think that was because of the second day. The second day, I just happened to be in a team that I would say wasn't very good. So I didn't end up shining as, 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 much, as, as much as he did. So What happened um, to him eventually? I don't, think he, I don't think he ended up signing or anything like that. Um, I don't know. I haven't spoken to him in a while. Um, but you know, the soccer world is so fast. You know, you meet somebody one day, um, you play in the same team, and now you, you know, you, you're best friends. And then <laughs> two days later, you don't, you don't know where they are. You don't know, you know, that yeah, that's yeah. just how it is. Yeah. So I went to the soccer visa trial, and I just took all the pressure off myself. And I said, you know, this may be the last time that I'm playing football like this again. Let me just enjoy it. And that's what I did. I think I played, I played some of the best football that I've played. And on the final day, there was a coach there from FC Lati in the Finnish Premier League. 
and he invited me to preseason with the team. And so now I'm thinking, oh, this is great. You know, this is this is my dream. And I kind of had one of those moments where time slows down and you feel like this is everything I ever worked for. So, you know, thank God. Um, fast forward, I came home. I'm preparing for the trial. I start playing with a professional team here. Um, start to what get you, what ready. Are your parents saying, right, what are your parents saying right now at this point? 23, 24? Um, I was 22 at the time. Okay. I just turned 23. So they're, they're just thinking, you know, Kim is still very much pursuing, you know, professional football. And now, look, he has an opportunity. So, you know, let him go for preseason with this team and see, see how it goes, you know. Um, so I come home, you know, I spend time with them. And then I start training again. And two weeks before I'm supposed to go, um, the person who was acting as my agent at the time basically told me that um, they can't take another international player. And um, the coach reached out to me and he told me, yeah, he's tried everything, but they can't take another international player. Um, at that point, I think I felt a lot of different kinds of emotions. Um, but you see, I had already gone through the process of, okay, whatever happens from this, at least now I know, you know, I think what I wanted in my life with regards to football is just to prove a lot of people wrong and to prove myself right. And when I met, you know, that coach and he said, Hey, you can play at this level. It kind of proved a lot of things for myself. And I know a lot of people say, Hey, I could have kept playing, you know, I could have um, found another opportunity. And um, I think some of the, the soccer visa guys didn't really understand when I told them that, I think I'm okay. I, I don't want to continue pursuing it um, because maybe there could have been other opportunities for me, but I think I was at peace um, and I don't regret that decision at all because it's brought me to where I am today. Um, and I can say that helping other players to achieve these opportunities is, is much more fulfilling than playing ever was to me. So I'm, yeah, I'm very, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to jump. I'm just going to jump in there. I mean, like I always say to people, as I said before, if you're good enough, you're going to make it. And like you got told, you got told there, it's almost like you, your journey was to be told that you could probably by the sounds of it, didn't, I won't say didn't want to, but maybe didn't have that extra 2% that you needed to, which that, that 2% is the, what the real want to do it. So like anybody else had been like, you've been told you're good enough for this level. You'd have been like, right, let's get let's get onto the other teams then. Let's let's see what else is about. But you were just kind of happy to be told that, and then you're like, I'm at peace now. And I remember I remember all this happening. I remember you documenting it and stuff pretty well. Um, and I remember thinking, yeah, he's at peace. That's cool. And that's everyone's individual and everyone it's all about themselves. But yeah, it's just maybe you didn't have the extra two percent to kind of to then step up and kind of do that. That's not me uh, digging at you or anything like that. That's just like maybe mm -hmm. trying to break it down in my own head. Because um, if if you were if you were going to make it, you'd have, you'd have, you'd have gone for it. But I think what you, the journey you've had and then everything, I mean, <laughs> like, obviously I've known you a while and there's a lot of that stuff I've, you've, you've said so far, I didn't know about. There's a lot of stuff I definitely didn't know about. It's quite a journey. Yeah. Um, and you, you now like, ah, I'm at peace, but you've got so much knowledge that, I mean, that's why I wanted you kind of involved with us because you've got so much knowledge, um, and an ex experience of the whole like not just like this whole america journey blah blah just like everything in general uh, where you can help people so that's where you're at now you so see you, you've i'm gonna jump in there and say you, you move back to you move back to kenya nairobi and you've been there since and then what's what's been going on yeah so um <clears throat> there was a period um beginning of 2017 where i told myself you know what let me just try and do something else apart from football you know let me just and what I realized is that my experiences were so, for this region of the world, they were so unheard of and so rich that I would have parents come up to me and they know my journey and they say, you know, can you please mentor my son? Can you? So I thought, of, I thought to myself, okay, let me, let me write a book. And so that's what I did. I wrote a book and I self-published it and I started to, you know, try and help people that way. But I just, the more I tried to run away from it, the more I realized that I could help some of those students and I knew that um, this is this is this is it just felt like the right thing for me to do especially given the opportunities that I had and so 
um, I got involved with uh, Green Sports Africa. Um, that didn't work out completely. Um, and I spent quite a bit of time there just trying to get, you know, some students some opportunities. And through you, um, I think we've been able to send five players on soccer scholarship opportunities um, from Kenya. And since that time, and in uh, around mid last year, that's when I started True Talents of Africa, which is our academy at the moment. Um, and since then, I mean, it just, it just feels like my life has kind of come full circle. Um, and now I realize that the experiences I have, um, there, there's a reason why I had them. And I honestly believe there's a reason I stopped when I did because it was kind of like perfect timing. Um, and I just, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer in things happen for a reason. And um, I have a lot of faith. And my plan or my ambition is to start a school here, a football academy that is that is a school that can just help not even not even necessarily football footballers, but you know, young young boys and girls who who just want opportunities in their life to become better men and women. And I think if you take the principles of football and teach them in the right way, um, you can do that. At the same time, I also want to give them opportunities because I see a lot of myself in many of the players, players that I coach now. Um, I just see myself as, as one of them and I see the struggles that they're going through and I just want to help them in the biggest way possible because I know what it would have meant to me back then because nobody taught me about nutrition. Nobody taught me about, you know, these are where the opportunities are. Honestly, if, if in fact, sometimes the way I think about it is if I was a young boy and I had met me uh, how I am now, I, I think I would have just latched on and been like, please help me because there was just no guidance at all. And I feel like it's the same now, but I see myself and the rest of the coaches at TTA and um, the people around me as we are the ones to kind of try and change the future of many of these aspiring players in, in our country and in this continent. So um, I'm, I'm just really thankful that it happened the way it did. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Like you, you kind of said before, so it's kind of like, it's awesome to have somebody like you uh, for these people and families in, in, well, not just in Nairobi, not just in Kenya, but East Africa, the whole continent. It's kind of some, there's not many people in the whole continent who can kind of have that knowledge that you've got because there's i mean we, we start obviously um you, you've come on board with us and we're starting the siusa africa uh, like division uh, situation and that's um hopefully going to help a lot of a lot of players over the next well years uh kind of give them the opportunities that right now um uh, to put it frankly people kind of always have a little joke about like getting emails from African kids who were desperate to kind of um, get, get seen and, and it's kind of delete, delete, delete. But there's end of the day, yeah. there's a human being, there's a human being behind that email. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like we have to, we have only so much time in the day to look after people and do stuff. But if we can kind of proactively put our heads together and kind of put ways for people to kind of, I mean, we've, we've talked about plans that we're going to do and stuff and, uh, and not necessarily, uh, big high financial things this is things where we're going to help uh, the, the ordinary boy to kind of go down this pathway or whatever pathway it takes but we're, we're going to be there to kind of help people progress and there's a lot of talented footballers and uh, ambitious talented people in the continent so hopefully we can do good things over the years and like say you're the perfect person in my eyes to kind of kind of lead that uh, you've got the right passion for it you've got the um the knowledge as well which is to keep talking about but yeah, it's just it's just great to have you on board with that one. But um, just kind of looking to wrap up. Um, apologies that this has gone longer than I told you it would. <laughs> I, I wasn't going to stop. Long story. No, no, I was inter I was interested, uh, and I'm sure a lot of people will be interested. So, right, let's say there's um, 
well, anyone could be listening to this, but let's, let's specifically like somebody from uh, Kenya or even just uh, any African uh, player. Um, what sort of advice would you have for them um, looking to kind of follow your footsteps in a sense of like go to college? Let's, you, you've, you've, come, you've gone definitely a very unconventional route of doing this. <laughs> it's, not the, it's not the typical, so let's not kind of go down that route. But uh, what, what's... I mean, we've spoke about this before, and even yourself, like you thought you were going to play for Arsenal, and that was kind of the ambition. And there's nothing, there's nothing yeah. wrong with ambition whatsoever. Like it's good to have that because if you're not going to get anywhere without ambition, but break it down. Like what's what? What do you tell the uh, the players out there what to expect? Because I know you've been dealing with that. How how to get from A to B, basically? Yeah, I think you know. I think the challenge is it's not as you know when you advise a player let's say in the west whether it's the uk or the us and you tell them you know what they should be doing the structures are already there for them to to kind of succeed in that particular thing so you may tell them you know train train harder and then there is a club that is you know training consistently every week or there is academies that they can join or there is a pathway for them to to go down that will get them to where they want to be in africa it's just those things don't exist for us. Um, and that's why I see it very much as, as our responsibility to kind of create those things. Um, and so my advice always to these players is, is I'm trying to show them just how demanding this career path really is. Because you can imagine somebody who's never had the exposure of seeing you know, top quality professional players or seeing the path that it takes to get to, to that level you almost kind of have a fantasy in your head and you're thinking, oh, okay, it's, not, it's really not that hard. You know, I can go from playing in Nairobi to playing for Arsenal, you know, tomorrow because I feel like I'm, I'm that kind of player. Um, and, and kids are young and they're, they're naive. They don't really know. Um, and trying to educate them on just how much it takes to, to even get close to that level, I think is something I'd want to do. But more importantly, I just want to create the structure that would enable them to to pursue it in a genuine way. So if that's in the form of, you know, this a football academy that we can we can have that we're bringing, you know, students in where they're training five, six times a week, uh, I know that then eventually, you know, we can help them to um to get to where they they want to be because now there is a structure in place and even working with the Ministry of Sports here in Kenya, there really isn't the system of development, when you take a young child from, let's say, 12 years of age to 18, this really isn't there um, in our country. And so I'm just trying to make sure that they don't experience what I experienced and there is some kind of structure there. So I want to advise them, but at the same time, I know it's also on people like me to create the structures for them to, to access those opportunities. Yeah. I agree. Um, and that's what people do. What, every generation, like the, the generation after you, um, they're, they're young, they can't do a lot of things, they can't create these structures. So it's like, it takes people from uh, the generation before to kind of put them structures in place, which is, there's very few people who can do that uh, and have that, have that experience that you've got. So it's kind of, a lot, a lot is on your shoulders, which to be honest with you, it's exciting. Like it's an exciting uh, lifetime ahead because you've got the kind of the whole world to work with and the kind of continent to work with. And it's, it's going to be like unbelievable. Uh, let's, let's say a conversation in 10 years from now, ever talk and we're like, wow, look what's happening in 10 years. It's amazing. And it's just like, it's like anything in the world. Like it's like NASA, like the, the generation before got to the moon and then they tested things out and tested a space flight. And then after that, the generation afterwards, right. Okay. That's, that's, that worked. Now we're going to build on that. And we've got the structure in place for that. It's like everything. Um, so it's going to be awesome. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, look, I probably, probably need to start wrapping up really now. Um, but <laughs> what, what, no, my, my, my next question was like really like yeah. what's your what's your future plans and ambitions but i'm guessing you you kind of answered that with saying you want to put the structures in place or is it is there anything else you've got future ambitions it's, it's building a school i think i've noticed that that is the one way that um you can actually help more students because that that is always the challenge that i have is i'll have somebody you know, with our current model, we partner with schools. But you see, not everybody goes to one particular school. And um, 
there's many students that contact us from all over Africa and you, you, it's just really difficult to tell them, okay, you need to come to this school so you can be part of this program. It just, the process is too long, but if you had, you know, a foot of residential academy where um, kind of like the one I experienced at IMG and you're telling these students, okay, um, this is the way to go. Come here first, you know, we'll evaluate you, we'll see, you know, we'll help you. We'll, just trying to give them as much guidance as, pro as possible. Um, you know, even looking at things like nutrition, you know, the mental side of the game and just all of these things need to be monitored so that we can genuinely have more players getting more opportunities um, because there's nobody doing it for us. There's no, um, yeah, there's just nobody doing it. And so that, that is my plan or that, that is what I believe for the moment. That is what I believe. Um, that's the path that we're going down. So if there's any uh, people out there with um, spare millions of dollars, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, mm. Any philanthropists who want to kind of get involved and kind of change change a lot of lives, uh, get in touch with Kim, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, no, no, yeah, really, they they really should because they, I mean, there's just so many, there's so many young players, young aspiring athletes that we need to help. And uh, I've seen I've seen it myself. So like I remember when I came to visit a couple of years ago, and I was like, a couple of players. I even said to you, I was like. That player there, if he was in England, he was he would be a professional club right now. <laughs> and just what, just because where he's born, like he's not. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of like yeah, yeah, stupid yeah. man. It's just it is what it is. It's the world. Like I mean, we're all trapped in our countries right now, I guess. But it's 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 unfair if a talent is not really uh, seen by everyone. But you get in there. It's 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 good. It's a good job what you're doing with the True Talents of Africa stuff. It's good what you did with the Green Sports Africa guys. Um, you and obviously now uh, you're doing the SI USA Africa stuff as well on top of that. So it's going to be really really good to see that. But um, is there anything you want to add to any of this before I kind of do wrap up? Um, no, just to say thank you to you. Um, and you've been a, a big part of my journey and. Um, a big help to to many of these young athletes. I mean, there are stories that I get that maybe I haven't even gotten to you about. You know, <laughs> there's a player I spoke to just the other day, and he was he was a day away from quitting and going to to university here. And you know, that's when he finally got an offer to the SIUSA program. And it's it's uh, yeah, just there's a lot of good that you're doing, and maybe you don't hear it on a, on a consistent basis, but um, I think there's more we can do, and I'm just thankful to to be a part of this thing now. Yeah, we'll try. We we'll try to do it better. We've all made mistakes and try to learn and try to always improve the processes. Which uh, which is why I asked you to come on board uh, with it all. But anyway, um, cool. All right, Kim. Well, I've really I've really enjoyed that. I'm sure people have as well. Um, if anyone wants to get in contact with you, like where can how can they do that? What are you on social media? Anything like that? Yeah, I'm on social media, um, Kimadi Kambudo. <laughs> they may even have trouble spelling that. But, it's all right. We'll put that in the, um, in the, true in the, in the yeah. We'll put the, we'll put that in the uh, podcast uh, comments. It's in there. We'll link it. Ah, sure, sure. Yeah, and if they want to, I mean, S I U S A Africa. Um, yeah, I, I think they they will be able to find me. <laughs> that's, that's funny, <laughs> me. Yeah, yeah. So we'll, we'll put that. We'll put in the description of wherever this is on YouTube. Apple, Spotify, whatever it's on, uh, it'll, have, it'll have the contact details for Kim. Uh, but he's very open. I'm sure he'll be happy to accept any direct messages, inbox, emails. Um, you've even got an email with us now, Kim at um, sportsrecruitingusa.com. So I'm pretty sure yes. he'll be able to answer any questions as well if anyone has any. So cool. All right, Kim. Well, thanks thanks for everything. Uh, awesome, like I say, to have you on board. And um, I appreciate you opening up and telling everyone the story how it is and hopefully that that this this podcast might help just one person uh which is what we all it's all we want really um and that's why we do it that's why we just spent an, nearly two hours talking <laughs> but right sure, sure yeah thanks chris i really appreciate it